Well, uh, thank you very much, everybody, for joining tonight. Uh, we got a lot to get through, so uh, we're going to be a bit brief, but hopefully that's okay. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so basically, we went through our online networking. It's what we do every meetup. We're going to go through a bunch of, I, I guess, the common questions we get, which is like, where do you invest? Uh, how can I quit my job? Stuff like that. And hopefully reframe the way you're thinking about these questions. Uh, I mentioned it uh, very briefly at the beginning to, to, to Sarah, uh, but that's what we're hoping to do to get you to think about a different way of how to answer or even ask these questions. Uh, we get a couple of case studies and then, you know, what your next steps might be. Next slide, please. Okay, who are we? So uh, our mission statement is basically to help people navigate this complex world of real estate investing. Um, when, you know, Matt and I started the real estate investment journey, we really wished there was a volition to help us through, um, you know, I'm going to really date myself, but there was absolutely no internet resources at the time. Uh, you know, I had to go to the library <laughs> to borrow books about real estate investing, and that information wasn't particularly good. There's better uh, resources these days, but once you start to dabble into real estate investing, you'll very quickly find that it's written in generalities because that's all you can really write about. Real estate is so local, uh, you know, I argue it's hyper local. You have to know exactly what's happening in your neighborhood on that street to make sure you're making the right real estate investment decision. And if you don't, uh, if you apply generalities uh, to real estate investing, like, oh, Toronto is a good place to invest, that ends up with some terrible decisions uh, because every city has areas you don't want to be in, areas you want to be in. Um, so we're a complete solution provider. Uh, we help every, we, we're, I like to think of us as end to end. We help you from designing, this is what really separates us. We help you design that real estate investment plan and journey. We help you execute on it as a real estate brokerage. Uh, we help with the construction uh, and renovation services if you need them. And we, oh, Matt, you're getting into some Sorry. funny slides. <laughs> At the end, Sorry. we get in, we, um, we, we help you with, um, we've got management partners as well. Um, so next slide, which okay. should be our credential slide. Sorry, go ahead. I'll, let me just try to fix this. So, uh, again, this is, you know, we're, this is not to impress you guys, but just to impress upon you that we know what we're doing. We've been investing for a very long time. We have fairly large personal portfolios. You know, we've been on everything from, uh, we've been fe featured on HGTV. Uh, so, you know, we, 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 we know real estate, you know, we know real estate investing. Um, next slide. This is, oh, a lot of people are new. I should mention we're, f we're quite casual. Uh, we don't have like a formal like presentation structure, you know, feel free to drop questions in the chat. If you got them, we, we may digress to answer some of this stuff. Uh, but yeah, we're not, you know, super formal. Uh, I'm wearing like uh, jogging pants below the suit. So like that's, that's how we roll. Um, next, uh, this question here, uh, sorry, this thing here is like the advisory realty renovation management. I already talked about that. These are the services we provide. So next slide, please. Oh, welcome, Daniel, the formal welcome. We've got a new member on our team. So so, you know, Daniel is a, a very bright young man, uh, much smarter and brighter than I was at that age. And now. Uh, he's got his master's in computer engineering. He's a passionate real estate investor. Um, Daniel, I, I'm not sure if Daniel's able to join tonight, but if he is, you can feel free to unmute yourself and just say hi to everybody. I don't know if he's there, so. Yeah, I see. <laughs> anyway, uh, we're... we're we're thrilled to have uh, Daniel on our team. Uh, and if you've been working with uh, Volition, you've already uh, run into Daniel. He's been helping us, uh, especially on the leasing side, uh, get some of our clients' properties leased up. So uh, we're thrilled to have Daniel. So everybody give him a, a warm welcome, please. Next slide. So this is the Volition team. Um, these are the uh, the, the folks you'd be working with. Uh, tonight, we've got quite a number of uh, members online as well. Uh, next slide, please. 
and we are hiring. So if you are a realtor and you are interested in taking your realty business to the next level, uh, or somebody who's just passionate about real, real estate investing, um, we come talk to us, uh, you know, drop us a line, uh, info at volitionprop.com. Uh, we're happy to chat. We're, we're, we're always growing. So, uh, looking for some, some awesome new folks. Uh, also, we, you know, general statement, but investor agents make the best normal agents um, because your your home is an investment, right? Um, and what I mean by this is like, let's say you're buying a personal residence. Is, you know, maybe you want to renovate a kitchen. Is that possible? Our investor agents know, you know, uh, the process for removing structural walls, for example, or they know that, uh, you know, how to verify zoning. Uh, in your area to see what you can do with that property. Could you turn this into a legal basement suite? Let's say you wanted to, to do that to your personal residence. Uh, what, is, what are the you know, demographic trends in the area? What's happening with public transit? This kind of stuff that matters to an investor should absolutely matter to you as an end user as well. Um, you don't need to be told the tile is nice or I like the countertop finishes. You, you know, an agent for that, that, there's no added value there. Uh, it's that more sophisticated lens, the financials and the financial prospects of a property, that's where, uh, you know, we, we, we can come in. Uh, and a lot of people are surprised, but a regular work accounts for about 50% of what we do. So we're quite experienced in this area as well. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, oh yes, and here's the uh, mission statement in a picture. Uh, <laughs> real estate investing is amazing, and Volition is that eraser. We try to really make things easy and help get through that that very complex maze. And tonight is really that roadmap through that maze of real estate investing. How to start uh, even getting through that maze? Uh, next slide, please. Just a reminder uh, to our folks, uh, if you if we missed you for whatever reason, we have our private mastermind chat group. This is exclusively for our investor clients uh, and advisory clients. Uh, so if we've missed you for whatever reason, please let us know. We'll make sure to add you. Next slide. There must be a delay <laughs> between what I uh, what I'm asking for the slide and what it's updating on my actual screen. So anyway, who the heck are we? We're basically, we're, we're like these guys, but we're not quite, if you go to the next slide we're, and the next slide after that. We're not quite as pretty. Uh, you know, we're like the, the, the Asian version of this. Or, or tall, <laughs> let's, let's be real. <laughs> um, so yeah, we like to think of ourselves as the Asian property brothers. We've done a lot of presentations together. Um, there's a little bit about ourselves, so you know who the heck we are before we get into this. I think the next slide's your yours uh matt i think i made you talk about yourself before i talked oh, about myself so you, you slid the slide in here um hi everyone so my name is matt yeah. so tell, I, tell us about yourself matt no pressure yeah i'm i'm trying to try to do this quick um so i've been a real estate investor for well over a decade now um when i got started i made a lot of wrong moves um i didn't have good help um I went chase the shiny object. It led me astray. It led me to a lot of uh, uh, investing in a lot of different places. And that's the reason I created Volition. I created Volition to be the helping hand to help investors be successful investing, and especially investing in Toronto. Investing in Toronto is not, not, not as easy or as straightforward as it is in some of these other places. So basically, my journey is not too much different than most people's, you know, started you know, I got educated as a, as a systems engineer, just like Julia, um, uh, and started climbing the corporate ladder. And I was going to buy a condo and a buddy told me, Hey, if you're going to buy a condo, why don't you buy a duplex? I was like, what the heck's a duplex? Uh, he's like, Oh, I live in one unit. I rent it the other. And I was like, why would I want to do that? All I remember from owning a house, or, or, or living in a house with my parents was like shoveling snow, just like today. That's why I was late for this meetup because I was shoveling snow. And I was like, why the hell would I want a house? Um, but uh, turns out it turned out to be a good investment. I, I went hunting for a duplex, accidentally bought a fourplex and the rest is history. 
So, uh, and then uh, this is a tour of one of my properties. We did a, uh, this is actually a picture of the property and a picture of Ming and I on the property looking down because we did a street smart tour and one of my, my, my property was one of the pre properties uh, featured on the street smart tour. So you might be able to see yourself in the picture if you guys are a long time uh, meetup attendees, but uh, that's me, right? That, that's me in a nutshell. Long before uh, COVID was a thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. um, so, you know, I've been investing in real estate for a long time as well. Uh, I guess 20, 20 years now. Um, I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, like a lot of people do. I thought it was the most amazing thing. And two or three weeks later, I went out and bought a rental property. It's the one in the top right corner there. Um, it was all wrong. It was illegal. Uh, I got fined. <laughs> like, I didn't know what I was doing. And I didn't have a team to, to help me either figure out what to do. Um, so I basically did real estate investing not very effectively for a while uh, until I started networking and connecting with who are now my business partners. And, uh, you know, that, that has drastically changed uh, how I approach real estate investing. So um, hopefully what you can learn from both me and Matt is what to avoid uh, through real estate investing. There's a couple of properties on there as well. I've got the same, same shot. Uh, I guess I stole from you, Matt. And yeah, uh, I'm a dad as well. Uh, that's probably takes up the other part of my time. And, I spent four hours shoveling on Monday. I made me question why I am in a house as well. <laughs> so next slide, please. Okay. So here's the, the main event, right? Uh, this, we get asked this all the time. Where's the best place to buy? Where's the best property to buy? Uh, you know, so solve all my real estate problems with with one with one sentence <laughs> so let, let's dive into this a little bit um next slide so you know as i was mentioning before we got into this presentation it's not really the right way to look at it if you know how to invest in real estate you, you don't even ask these questions actually you're asking different questions so let's go to the next uh next slide so as I mentioned, what you're not looking at what the best investment property to buy. Next slide. Uh, and I, I added this little line in. It's, it used to say what drives real estate market, but really we're talking about the macroeconomic fundamentals of what drives real estate market. Uh, next slide. By the way, this is a condensed version, a so, very condensed version of a full day uh, masterclass crash course that we actually deliver um, every year. Um, so what you're seeing is a very, very small slice, uh, just a quick kind of cursory overview of a full day uh, event that we run. So if it's brief and you don't quite understand why it's so brief, that's why. <laughs> yeah, if it feels like we're going a mile a minute, we yeah, apologize, but we are, yeah, we're basically trying to condense uh, a day down to a couple, into an hour or two. So, you know, which market should I invest in? We're going to break that, if you can go to the next slide, into a couple of questions to think about as you're investing. So let's start with, you know, where could I invest? Really, you could invest anywhere in the world, right? Uh, I mean, within reason, but you could take your money, uh, figure out another country and go invest there. You could, you could invest anywhere. Um, so, you know, out of all these potential places to invest, how do you start whittling it down? Well, the same place that you'd want to put your money, they're similar questions to where you'd want to put yourself, right? Um, you know, you wouldn't want to put your money in a country going through war or a country that's politically in, uh, unstable right now. Uh, and you, you certainly want to want to put yourself there. So, you know, the, the questions around what drives, uh, you know, where a good place to invest is also where would be a good place to live? These are very, very related, um, you know, questions. So let's, let's dive down a little further. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, you know, I'll put it out there that Canada is actually a great place to invest. Let's think about it, right? We've got political stability, you know, uh, our political news is far more boring than our friends to the South uh, or our friends across the pond uh, because, and that's a great thing, right? Uh, that we have 
frankly, slightly boring politics. Uh, we're immigration friendly. Uh, what does that matter? Because it means that we have, we, we, our population is growing. We'll get into it a bit later why we care about our population growing, but we're immigration fr uh, friendly. And we're one of the few countries that remains immigration friendly. A lot of countries are closing their doors these days. Uh, great public health care, again, that encourages people to come to the country. High standard of living, good education system, and we have a steady growing GDP here, which means jobs, job opportunities, job growth. And the number one reason for anybody moving is for job, right? Next slide, please. So given that Canada is so great, you know, we've got, uh, we've got a number of options to live in within Canada. Where are people actually moving? So if you look here, this is what we're seeing. The majority of people are moving into the GTA. So let's uh, go to the next slide. So why, why is it Ontario? Like why, why Ontario versus, you know, some of the other provinces? You know, we've got low crime rates, good multicultural population here, uh, lots of diversity and culture, um, you know, with stable government. And within Ontario, Toronto itself is an economic hub. And as I mentioned, you know, the majority of people are moving for job reasons, uh, which leads us to a kind of our, our next slide. What are, so let's say, you know, we've, we've taken this multitude of possibilities. We're looking at the world into Canada. Okay, Ontario is kind of this economic driver, Canada. Toronto seems to be an economic driver within Ontario. Okay, let's say that's generally the area that we're looking at. What is going to help us refine further? What else matters uh, when we're looking at where to invest in real estate? So where's the economic growth? Next slide. You know, I'm sure this is no surprise, <laughs> but economic growth within uh, Ontario is Toronto itself. And I'm not going to go through all the details here, but uh, the things to take away from this is that it's not just growth of the economy that matters. It's the diversity and stability of growth that matters. We're not a one industry town. Right. And I was mentioning earlier that these, you know, when we're talking about investing, there are some people from the U.S., you know, this matters in your area, too. Right. When you're looking for the, the major economic area, you're not just looking for good job growth. You're looking for diverse. So you don't want it to be like a steel town or, you know, something that is a single industry relying on I don't know, the auto industry. You want diversity in that uh, in that jo job base uh, you want it to be an economic leader within the area because it still matters uh, you know e even with some uh, you know COVID influencing working from home people are still moving to Canada and the general work areas for these jobs uh, and even post-COVID we're still looking at a population increase in the downtown for example uh, there it's expected to to double from 240 to 475 uh, by 2041. Next slide, please. Usually, we jump into some very detailed metrics every month about how this actually pans out. But what I wanted to show today is that uh, this stuff matters. And here's some here's uh, you know a very quick example. We you look at the resiliency uh, in the real estate market. Um, you know, look through 2017, we take some very detailed da data, we go neighborhood by neighborhood. But basically, if I look back to 2017 compared to now, through all the blips that we've had through uh, 2017, 2018, some of the stuff that's happened to our economy, COVID, um, we've not only uh, maintained resiliency, we've uh, improved uh, when it comes to pricing. In the next slide, contrast that to some of the areas around Toronto and you'll see there's actually quite a big uh, difference there was a big spike in 2017 in some of the you know the the upper neighborhoods the the Vaughns the Richmond Hills and then it prices actually came down uh through 2017 2018 and it took quite a while before it started to recover back to those 2017 levels so it's a it's you know this is what I mean by a tale of two cities because you can say Toronto is a good place to invest or any other major urban market or Hamilton or whatever you want to say, but until you start really breaking it down in a more granular level and understanding neighborhood by neighborhood, do you really get the information? Next slide, please. So who are the customers from my business? So let's say I know where to, okay, uh, I get it, Ming, invest in a major urban market because of all these reasons. Great. Now, 
who do I want as my clients? Who do I want as my tenants? We'll put it out there, millennials and Gen Z, basically people in their 20s and 30s. So, you know, why this demographic? One, they're the largest rental cohort, right? Usually when you're fresh out of university, you're not going in or buying a house right away. Most of you are, you know, most people aren't in an economic uh, position to go and buy a, a property, even if you're in a, uh, you know, cheaper area. Specifically, we're looking for, you know, young professional millennials or millennials, are probably a bad term. They're getting a little older now, Gen Z is people 20, 30, uh, because, you know, they're responsible, you know, they, professionals that have good jobs, you know, we're talking about like data analysts and things like that. Um, this is very different from what Matt loves to call the beer and weed crowd. And what I mean by that is every month when rent is due, they're paying their bill uh, as opposed to going out and taking their money and buying beer and weed. And then whatever's left over, they're going to pay rent. Uh, and, you know, this is part of the challenge we've seen in some other uh, areas. We can't attract the same young professional demographic. They don't want to live in, in the middle of nowhere. They want to live in these cool hipster, uh, you know, live work neighborhoods. Um, and not every city provides that. And then one of the most important things about this demographic is they're inherently transient. When you're in your 20s and your early 30s, you're not living, when you're renting, you're not living in that same place for, you know, five, 10 years. Your life is inherently more dynamic. You've got roommates and, you know, your roommate might have a girlfriend or boyfriend and they move out and then you've got to find a new place. You want actually some tenant turnover. Uh, and that you'll find is very important when we get into the risk mitigation strategies, which we take in real estate investing. Uh, next slide. Okay, Meg, we're going to need to speed it up. You're supposed to be spending one minute per slide. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> okay, where's real estate demand? Next slide. So to cut, to, to get Matt back on track, it's, it's the downtown. Uh, and, you know, the downtown core is a, you know, we're not talking like financial district. There's, there's quite a number of neighborhoods, but it's, I'd say, uh, we'll get into the actual neighborhoods, but let's just put this at downtown core. There's a lot of reasons behind this, but we won't get into all of them right now. Next slide. D downtown core and the residential neighborhoods surrounding downtown core. Yeah. Yes. So what type of asset should I buy? A lot of times we get asked, oh, you know, should I buy a condo? Should I buy a duplex? Should I buy, you know, a small apartment building? The answer is, next slide, please. You know, we're making general terms here, but what you want to buy is land, right? You don't want fractional ownership. So if you buy a condo, you're having fractional ownership of land, you know, with all the other condo owners versus if you own a, you know, a detached home, you own all that land. Now, um, obviously it's quite expensive to do that. And we'll get into some strategies on how to get around uh, and how to buy land, but the land is what's valuable, not the house on it. The house on it is actually depreciating over time. And if you've got to go to accountant, they are depreciating that value of your property for you over time as well. So land, next slide. Single most desirable feature. Anybody know what the most important thing is that we're looking for when we're trying to figure out where to buy within a city? Location. Let's let's go in. Let's uh, let's go to the slide. Transit. There we go. So yeah, transit really matter, and not just any transit, right? Like buying a house near a bus stop doesn't cut it. Uh, you gotta be near what we call rapid-ish transit. <laughs> and I use rapid-ish because uh, some streetcar lines matter because they are dedicated uh, and uninstructed by, uh, you know, street traffic, but basically not uh, good transit uh, connections. We have a whole presentation around how we rank various, uh, you know, transit and transit connections. I think we gave it uh, in October or August or something of last year. So you can look it up on our website. Or but Shelby, transit, yes, transit. Maybe, maybe Shelby can drop it in uh, in in the chat. Uh, it was okay. entitled. Oh, thanks, Shelby. It's it, it's called uh, uh, Toronto's next next hottest neighborhood. So uh, yeah, yep. a whole presentation just on that. Cool. Next slide.
Is it showing up for you? Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just, just it's a little slow. Uh, so anyway, in summary, we talked about these are the questions that you have to ask when you're real estate investing. Where's the economic growth? Who are those customers? And you should really be able to answer this. If you're in student rental properties, for example, you better know you know, which universities, which programs, what their co-op program is like. So therefore, you know how in and, you know, often they're coming in and out of your property. Like in, these are the questions, doesn't matter what kind of real estate investing you, you, you need to understand. Uh, where's the demand uh, for my, in my particular area? What type of asset makes sense for my particular area? Uh, and what is the most desirable feature? That is kind of universally applicable, but these are really the most uh, important questions. There's other factors as well, which are, you know, we don't have time to really get into today, but uh, you know, many people who are investing in these major urban markets, these investors are not just looking for some of the things we talked above, they're looking for wealth preservation. You know, has this city stood the test of time through economic problems? Uh, what's the long-term prospects, 20, 30 years? Like if you are in a fortunate enough place in your life that you've got wealth to pass down to generations after you, you know, you don't care about getting an extra hundred bucks or 200 bucks a month cash flow, but you really care about being able to pass that to the next generation. And this is the right place for you to invest, to be able to do that. Uh, next slide. Okay. So now we're going to get into time in the market. This is one of my favorite sayings. It's based off, it's not about timing the market. It's about time in the market. But we took this and we turned it into our risk mitigation strategy because, you know, I come from a finance background. After I went to Waterloo and did, did uh, computer science there, I realized I hated it <laughs> and I ended up kind of in the finance world. And, you know, one of the things that is very common in the finance industry, which you don't see applied as much to real estate investing, is risk analysis and risk mitigation. Um, so we're talk we'll talk a bit about, you know, what... I think this is what separates our approach to real estate investing from a lot of other approaches um, because that's what really separates you from somebody who's just lucky, especially in a booming market right now. Market's been great. You could have invested anywhere and you look like a genius, but it's a real estate cycle for a reason. It's going to come down. So next slide. And when it does come down, are, are you positioned in, you know, to, to, to ride that down wave, right? Uh, next slide. Next one. Yep. Okay. So time is an acronym for us. It, these are the four major areas of risks uh, that are involved in real estate investing. There are others, but these are really the four big ones. Uh, tenant risk, you know, risk that your tenant brings to your operation. Uh, investor risk, that's really the risk you bring to, uh, to your operation. Uh, the market risk, which we talked a bit about already. Uh, you know, that's mitigating it through buying in the right market and then a state. And this is specific to the property itself, the location itself. So let's, uh, let's go to the next slide. Okay. So this is, you know, zooming in on tenant risk. This is really going to be our, you know, tenant profile uh, risk that we have to look at. So I was answering a question earlier on, you know, what is, are there any, landlord friendly markets not really uh tenant is always going to be a risk so and in ontario ontario is pretty uh tenant friendly so are a lot of other provinces but ontario is pretty tenant friendly so tenant is really going to be our big our biggest risk so it's really important that we our risk mitigation strategies are built primarily around getting the right tenants and i use the term right instead of best because I think there, there needs to be clarity between those two. If you go to the next slide, Matt. So who are, you know, who are these right tenants? We already talked about millennials. You know, that's who you know, we're interested in attracting because they are a large tenant profile. But importantly, you know, we mentioned professionals. You know, early out of university, they're into their first or maybe second job. Uh, earning 65, 85K, uh, you know, they're working in the downtown core or these days, you know, uh, working remotely, um, but able to access the downtown core so they can get to, you know, friends, cultural things, uh, you know, restaurants, the, the, you know, what, what attracts them to urban culture. Um, 
So connected to, uh, to transit is very important. You know, not looking at any more than about a 35 to maybe 40 minute commute. When we start get pass out, our data shows people are willing to live in in, in smaller properties. Uh, like you really need to know your tenants, uh, but you know you want to attract those best tenants. And the great thing about this age demographic as well, you know, they are transient. So why do you want a tenant who's moving every few years? Anybody? Uh, Anybody have any answers? Like what a lot of people think the best tenant is somebody who's got a good job, who'll sit there and pay your bills for the next 10 years. Increase rents. Absolutely. Because right now is it there are things you can do to increase rents. Um, you know, rent evictions and stuff like that, but that's that's not our jam, right? Like we don't believe in that kind of stuff. If you're attracting the right tenant profile, they'll be transient naturally. They'll move out after a couple of years because that's part of their life. Uh, then you don't have to deal with all that, you know, I would call it slightly gray area stuff where you're trying to get people out. Uh, next slide, please. So that's why, you know, we, we prefer this tenant profile. So let's go on to the next one, investor risk. So this is the risk that you bring to, um, to your investment. How do you mitigate this? How do you know what you're doing? <laughs> so first, foremost, get yourself educated come to events like this and make sure they're local to the areas that you want to be interested in. I'll go back to, you know, the, the questions that we're getting earlier, like, you know, should I be looking at specific areas? Frankly, you know, as long as you're meeting the fundamentals, pick an area and learn it, become a local expert. Toronto, for example, you know, I, I love to say this, if you don't know the difference between High Park and Moss Park and Regent Park, and you all think they're just parks, you shouldn't be investing in Toronto, right? There are major differences between these neighborhoods. They're not all the same. So, you know, you become a local expert. Does the business model you're looking at apply to your area? You know, we were talking about flips earlier. I would not be flipping unless I'm doing some sort of value add right now in Toronto. Doesn't work. Um, Who's your, tar tar who's your target demographic? Uh, are you servicing them? So you're, if you're looking at, at a professional millennial, are you investing in properties that those people want to live? If you're not, you're not going to be attracting the right tenant profile. A lot of people buy properties, which, you know, the numbers work, and then now they're trying to find tenants to fill them, but those tenants don't want to live in that property. So you, it's the other way around. What does your tenants, who are the tenants you're after, those best tenants or those right tenants, what do they want to live in? And are you designing and investing in the right properties that are going to attract that tenant profile? And lastly, do you have the team to execute? This is really key uh, because you're, you're never going to know everything. You need to build up expertise to fill in those gaps. I'm not an accountant. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a mortgage broker. I don't have intentions of ever being that, but I'm the CEO of my own, you know, real estate investment company. I need to find a great CFO. I need to find a great lender. Uh, I need to fill in all those gaps. So that way I'm able to execute successfully. Next slide. So as we mentioned, market risk, we already talked a little bit about this, so I won't go into too much, but basically we're looking for diverse economies, job growth. Next slide. Uh, and actually, uh, lower cap rates. This, if you understand commercial real estate investing, when you first understand, it, you're like, oh, cap rates, that's my return. Why wouldn't I want a 10, 12, 15 cap? Well, cap rate is a uh, directly related to the risk in a market. You get a higher cap because a market is more risky. So you don't necessarily want like a one cap or a two cap, but you don't you, there, if you find something out there that's a 10 or 15 cap, there's a reason. And if you don't understand the reason or you don't have strategies to mitigate the risk of a 10 cap investment, you should not be buying a 10 cap investment. Um, anyway, we've got lots of data to support this, uh, you know, the things we're talking about here. Next slide, please. Last one's a state. So is this property that you're looking at actually the right investment property? You know, 99% of investment properties don't work, right? Investment, uh, it drives me nuts when I see all these like performers on MLS and the numbers don't make any sense. And, uh, you know, people are calling them investment properties. Um, people ask me, should I invest in pre-con? The sa same thing, like that's such a broad sweep. 
99% of pre-con investments don't make sense. Uh, you only want to get into that kind of 1% of properties that actually do make sense as investments, uh, whether they be pre-construction, you're looking at, uh, you know, major renovation, laneway suite development, all this kind of stuff. There's only a small number that actually work. Uh, unfortunately for us in our business, there's only a small number that actually work. Um, so you want to make sure you're buy buying in the right areas and the right neighborhoods. And, you know, not every... You know, to get into a little more detail, not every property works for a triplex. You can't just go buy a single family home and say, okay, I'm going to turn this into a triplex. You have to make sure that are you meeting minimum ceiling height requirements? If you're not, what's your underpinning strategy? Is there, you know, what's your, you need egress. Are you, you have 0.9 meter egress that's required on, uh, on your property. Like there's all sorts of things you have to be considering uh, when you're looking at doing a triplex or a duplex or whatever it happens to be. And you have to make sure that the property allows for it because you can't just go back and get more property line or more setback if that's what you need. Next slide, please. So, you know, at a high level, things you're looking for in a neighborhood, gentrification, you know, you, you want to be buying not before gentrification occurs because you sometimes can be sitting in a neighborhood where gentrification just isn't happening. Gentrification, you know, makes the neighborhood nicer, drives property values. You want to be catching gentrification as it's going up. Transit, as we talked about, infrastructure is important, and the right tenant profiles. Um, yeah, here's a bunch of other stuff. Uh, we talked about setbacks, laneway access, ceiling heights. There's a, a myriad of things. We're not architects, but we have experience as investors doing a lot of this stuff. Next slide, please. Okay, so moving, shifting gears and looking now at the financial side of investing. So a lot of times people are very cash flow focused and that's not a bad thing. I was very cash flow focused at one point in time too. What I'm hoping for the next five minutes is to kind of take everybody through a evolution and understanding that role of cash flow itself. So when is cash flow actually important? We're hoping to, to answer that question. So uh, next slide, please. So most investors, when they start investing, they're thinking about appreciation. They're slowly thinking about appreciation. But, but you know, this is your, uh, you know, I don't want to throw pre-cons under the bus because they can work sometimes, but uh, you know, this is your typical pre-con investor is like, oh, I bought it for X number of dollars, 500,000. Now my condos were 600,000. Great. I made a hundred thousand dollars. And that's very simple. Everybody understands buy low, sell high. But if you're here today, you probably know a little bit more about that. Next thing is you understand the role of cash flow. You're like, oh, you know, I can rent this property out and it's going to exceed my expenses. Every month I'm going to get 200 bucks in my bank account. That's amazing. Cash flow is king. And this is Unfortunately, where a lot of investors, I think, get stuck. Uh, it's an easy concept to understand once you, you learn about cash flow, um, but there, there's a bigger picture behind cash flow. And what I'm hoping to get everybody to is, you know, what does cash flow mean? Like, what, how does it actually help your business? Uh, how does it indicate risk? And how does it compare to the rest of the returns in real estate? Um, because cash flow is actually, I'd say, almost negligible when it comes to real estate uh, returns. Next slide, please. So, um, two hundred fifty dollars versus five hundred dollars a month in cash flow. Uh, little story here. So, I, I remember once I had, uh, you know, I'd found a deal and it was making an extra you know, 200, 300 bucks more than everything else on the market at the time in cash flow. I went to my mentor and I said, hey, like, look, I'm awesome. Look at this deal I found. It makes a couple extra hundred bucks in cash flow. And, you know, he, he, he kind of turned to me and said like, oh, great. So what are you going to do now? You're going to retire? Uh, <laughs> so like, that was not the, um, uh, you know, the response I expected, but it was absolutely the right advice because, it didn't mean I was going to retire, right? I was still working full time and another 200 bucks a month didn't, doesn't do a damn thing to be quite frank. And what actually matters more was, you know, was I attracting the right tenant profile? Because if I got a crappy tenant profile, 200 bucks a month is not worth it. If anybody here has in, invested in areas where you've got bad tenants, 
oh, you can't get rid of that property fast enough. Uh, and another $200, $300 a month doesn't, doesn't even begin to, to, to matter uh, if you're dealing with tenant problems. So, um, you know, with that in mind, let's go to the next slide. So less cash flow, aka cap rate, is an indicator of risk. High cash flow generally means you're in an area where uh, there's more risk. Now, this can be market risk, it can be tenant risk, it can be economic stability risk, but there is something, if, if you're looking at, let's say, investing in 10 cap versus like a four cap market, that um, there are differences, right? We are not smarter than the market. Uh, at best, we can understand the market and play within it, but we're not smarter than the market. So if you're getting better cash flows, higher cap rates, there is more risk, you need to understand what it is. And that can be fine. It can be totally fine investing in higher risk, but you just need to, you know, don't fool yourself. Know that you there's higher risk and you are prepared to handle that risk. Next, uh, next slide. So just kind of a question to everybody. If you were looking at... Um, you know, cash flow compared to appreciation, right? If you had to choose 5% appreciation and $2,000 in cash flow or 7% appreciation and $500 in cash flow, which would you choose? The first one's four times the cash flow and the other is 2% more appreciation. So let's go into the numbers. At 5% appreciation, you know, not going through all this math, but let's just keep an eye on that final uh, that final number there, a million dollar property, 25 years, 5% appreciation, $2,000 cash flow. We're looking at about 4.4 million. But a 7% appreciation and like a, a quarter of the cash flow, two more percent appreciation. We're at almost 6 million bucks, 5.9. So if you go to the next slide, that's a delta of, you know, almost one half million dollars there. And I'm not saying go and buy negative cash flowing properties or, you know, don't pay attention at all to cash flow. Cash flow still matters. Uh, you know, to go to the next slide, please. Cash flow still matters. It helps us, uh, you know, float through problems in, you know, tenants, right? Tenant vacancy. It helps you with the costs of, of repairs, but it is not the be all and end all. What is actually very important is, are you investing in market with long-term appreciation? In the next 25 years, is this going to be a market where, you know, once COVID is all said and done and we're, you know, back to whatever normal is, that, you know, people will still be emigrating to, right? People want to come to, to this city, in this country, uh, for whatever reason. Is it still growing in the long term? And that's what's really important. In, in 25 years time, does the, does the place that you're investing hold up to that? So you can get that long-term appreciation. Next slide. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> Matt, hey. over to you. Is this, uh, is this your mic drop? Your, your this is my mic drop now. <laughs> cool. Thanks, Ming. Uh, let's see if I can speed through my section. Um, I want to take you on a bit of a, a different journey now. Um, I want us to look with new eyes um, at how to invest in real estate. So the average person, what they're going to do, they're going to buy something, maybe sit on it for 25 years or 30 years until the mortgage pay gets paid off. Pretty typical, right? So what my parents wanted to do, um, buy a property, wait 30 years. What, what happens in 30 years? Okay, yeah, your property value goes up, call it 5%. Uh, your rent goes up, call it 3% year over year. Eventually, your mortgage gets paid off, your expenses go up over time, and let's say you know your cash flow improves. Great, $13,000 of cash flow sounds pretty good, right? Um, <clears throat> I'm not interested in doing what everyone else is doing. I'm interested in doing it faster and doing it better. That is the volition approach. We want to do it faster, we want to do it better. We want to be more sophisticated. Now, what is that? What is what is doing it faster, doing it better. What does that actually mean? Now let's take a look. So again, I want to look at this with new eyes. Same, same thing, same market, same property. It's how I'm approaching it. How I'm approaching it is going to be a little bit different. So what happens here, this is what Volition has double, uh, dubbed the multiplier effect. So the idea here is at about 5% growth, 
in about four years, you would have built enough equity in the property and pay down enough of the mortgage so that you could refinance and go buy another property. You could do a refinance, do an equity takeout that's equal to the down payment closing costs of another like property. You effectively turn one monopoly house into two monopoly houses. That takes about four years at 5% growth. 5.5% growth, 5.4% growth is the Canadian average over the past 32 years. Canadian average. We're not talking about Toronto. Toronto far exceeds that. Let's see, let's see what, the, what happens here. Year four, year eight, year 12. This could be part of your plan. You could you you may need not need to go to year 12. This is this it depends on you. But let's just say that you know you reach year 12 and you reach eight properties and you just wait. What are you waiting for? You wait another six years while you pay down the mortgages. Am I paying the mortgages all down to uh sorry, you pay down the mortgages a little bit and you wait for the market to appreciate. Are you waiting to pay down the mortgages to zero? You're not paying, you're not waiting to pay down the mortgage to zero. Look what you could do instead. Once you reach 50% loan to value, that means that you have the, the balance of your mortgages is about 50% of the overall value of your portfolio. So if your property is worth a million bucks, you have a mortgage of 500,000, 500, right? What this allows you to do, in theory, is sell off half your portfolio and pay off the mortgages of the other half. Let me repeat that. It allows you to pay off the mortgage. Uh, selling half your properties allows you to pay off the mortgages of the other half, meaning that you have now half as many properties, but they're all free and clear. This is how you do it faster. This is how you do it better. So let, here, let's, let's take a look back at what this used to look like. You wait 30 years. I don't want to wait 30 years. I want to do it in maybe 12 years or 18 years. And in in, eight, in this example, in 18 years, we don't just have one property, we have four, all paid off, pure cash flow. This is when cash flow matters. So coming back to what Ming was talking about, does the 200 bucks, 500 bucks, whatever, even a thousand bucks, it's not life-changing. That's not life-changing. Life-changing is this, this kind of stuff here. And this is not far-fetched. This is very doable. Uh, this is what, this is the path that, we are on this is the path that all volition investors are on yeah, it's slightly different tra trajectories but the yeah, same we've had investors retire based on this right yeah this is not this is theory put into practice right this is not just uh read a textbook or read a blog or something like that this is real stuff people do have done this our investors have done this um so i want to talk about now the volition multiplier effect and why it works so well in toronto and it's because Toronto is a high growth market. So over the past many years, Toronto has averaged uh, roughly about 10% on freehold houses where you own land and about 7% on condos. So if we were to use 10%, I'm not sure, can you see my cursor? Okay, let's just say you can see my cursor. This 10% uh, growth rate translates into not a four year uh, doubling period, it translates into a two and a half year doubling period, meaning that you can go double, double, double much faster. And this is not a 12 year uh, growth pattern during the, the acquisition phase. This might be seven and a half years. And it might be only four years to get to uh, divesting instead of six years. Overall, this could, do, this could be less than 12 years. And then what would this actually look like? If you were to take a property, wait 30 years, this is basically the end result. You have a you know 30 years, a $1.4 million property, 10% um, growth rate. Granted, I can't, I'm not going to say it's going to be 10 year, 10% uh, year over year for the next indefinite. I'm just saying this is what we have seen. This is what we never model using this. I'm using this for illustration purposes. So the but the idea here is instead of 30 years, we can do it in about 12 years or approximately one third of the time. And the end result. Instead of $144,000 of positive cash flow, we have approximately double that, a little more than double. So the idea here is, again, looking at the same problem with new eyes and coming up with better solutions. Okay, so I've tried to, if you didn't catch all that, uh, forgive me. Usually I, I spend <laughs> 20 or, usually I spend about 30 minutes on that section. So uh, my apologies, but 
I do need to speed through a couple of other things. Um, so then the, then the next question is, what do I buy? This is now kind of the meat and potatoes. This is really what you probably came here, uh, come, came here tonight for. What do I buy? So I'm going to use this as an opportunity to demonstrate basically the myriad of different investing options that probably 98% of you will fall into, right? Uh, of course, you know, some of you are going to go into, you know, maybe some other stuff, maybe flipping or wholesaling or commercial or whatever, but 99, 98 to 99% of you are going to fall in, this, in these buckets here. Number one, small town investing. So this would suggest that we hate small town investing or we look very unfavorably upon it. The reality is I recognize and everyone recognizes there is people have made a lot of town, a lot of, a lot of money in small town investing. I've invested in small towns. Uh, my partners have uh, within the, 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 the leadership at, here at Volition, we've invested in Hamilton. We've invested in uh, KWC. We've invested in Edmonton and Sudbury. We went chasing that shiny object. And I can tell you the experience that we've had led us to double to divest and double down, return back to Tr Toronto and double down back in Toronto. Um, I'm not going to get into why. I'm not going to get into all the details why, but the, I, the it really comes back to the four risk factors of real estate, the ones that we talked about before, TIME, and primarily around tenant. That is one of the biggest things. Okay, So who is it for? It is cheaper. It's more affordable. No one's denying that. Everyone recognizes cash flow is better. It's actually much easier to invest in a small town for that reason because you can swing a dead cat and hit a dozen properties at all cash flow. Can't do that in Toronto. So if you're heavily if you're primarily focused on cash flow, then you might need a you might need to invest in a Windsor or a Hamilton or a St. Catharines or something like that or Oshawa or where, wherever or where, what have you, right? Um, but if we can open your mind to the world of poss uh, a different world of possibilities, then bear with me and we'll see where we can take you, right? So here in Toronto, pre-construction condos uh, have their place. Not all of them are good. In fact, I would say 99% of them are bad for investment purposes, right? Um, so again, Ming has said, it's too broad to say pre-construction condo. We occasionally do find ones that, that work. However, I don't think we've sold one in about two, in about two years. Oh, correct me if I'm wrong. I, I think we sold a couple last year, but um, it's not a big part of our business because very rarely does it actually work. Uh, but what is it for? Makes sense if you need the deposit structure. It makes sense if you're having financing issues in the short term and you want to push that out to whatever, right? It does have its place. Resale condos. Um, it's entry level investment. Um, the reason it, you can still attract a, a great tenant profile if you're choosing the right areas. The problem, though, is that it's hard to cash flow, and in fact, it's almost impossible to cash flow at 20% down, meaning 25% down, 30% down, or you have to employ a, a different business model like Airbnb, short-term rentals, um, and then that lets that, that this whole that leads you down another path. Uh, you need to find the right buildings that allow short-term rentals, and you have to look at the long-term viability of that building and the condo. Um, condos change their rules, right? So, anyway. For the most part, normal uh, long-term rental condos don't cash flow. That's what makes it very difficult. Now, moving on then, let's get to land. So this is where it starts making sense. Owning land, owning a house. Single family, not in Toronto. That's a, that's a, that's a pipe dream. Nothing in Toronto as a single family is going to work as an investment. It's not going to cash flow. So all those people who say they invest in Toronto and they bought, you know, a bungalow for one and a half million in Willowdale, you know, yes, it might have go might have gone up five hundred thousand dollars. And great to me, that's no different than going to Vegas and putting it all in black, right? So going to Vegas, putting it all in black, that's that's the equivalent of of investing in a single family or you know some bungalow in 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 Willowdale or Richmond Hill or something like that. $3,000 in rent when, and you're going to be $2,000 negative cash flow. Does that make sense? Mm, there's better ways to do it. 
Oh, sorry. And then so uh, what, the what that leads to then is duplex, triplex. So what we're talking about here is entry level, um, smaller duplexes and triplexes. Um, typically, we can find this in about the 1.35, 1 1.4 1 range as an entry level uh, multifamily in good neighborhoods um, in, in downtown Toronto. Good neighborhoods, not the best neighborhoods. There's still a premium associated with getting into the better neighborhoods. But this, you know, this could very well still be uh, East York. This could be more Lansdowne. Uh, this could be up near St. Saint, um, uh, Saint Clair. Um, there are areas that, that it does work. Okay, so, or you, can, or you could start going down the rental path. So you could buy a house and add a suite yourself. This is where, um, you know, the old HGTV, this is the whole Scott McGilvery income property. Um, uh, this is where it comes in. Like, this is adding value to the property. This is one way that you can get to better cash flow. And in fact, because you're putting in um, sweat equity, or at least you're going through the pains of putting in the basement suite yourself or secondary suite yourself, you're adding value. So at Volition, we like to say that if, you, if you're doing renos, um, if you put in $100,000 of renos, you should be getting more than $100,000 of value out. That could be you know, $125,000 of value, $150,000 of value out. If you put $100,000 in, uh, it's somewhere in that range, uh, anywhere from like 1.25 to 1.5. So for every dollar you put in, you should be you're seeing anywhere from a buck 25 to a buck 50 out. But this allows you to get to cash flow potentially. Uh, next one is taking rentals to the next level. Um, taking rentals to the next level might be an understatement here because this is a five hundred thousand dollar reno. Uh, this is a legal luxury triplex conversion, or maybe a legal luxury fourplex conversion. Not going to dwell on this too long, but this is not for the faint of heart. This is a very big project, um, and it takes anywhere from twelve to sixteen months. And uh, it requires you to go to COA, the Committee of Adjustments. So, uh, and it, COA opens you up to scrutiny from your neighbors and stuff like that. So, um, a much more convoluted path, not for the faint of heart. We don't usually recommend this if this is your first investment property out of the gate. But amazing potential. You can get some amazing, some really, really solid uh, equity lift. Uh, and even after doing the renovation, and for those of you who are a little more sophisticated, the buy, rent, or rent, refi, after you refinance back up to 80% loan to value, if you could qualify for that, you'll still cash flow a thousand bucks on this, even after you do the refinance and get a large chunk of your capital back out. And then leads us to laneway suites. Laneway suites is not a business model unto itself, it's a tack on to these ones here entry level multi house and adding with suite or legal luxury uh, triplex or fourplex conversion because you could do it to any one of these um, but it's a this is this is this is the new trend in toronto laneway housing lane, laneway suites are a fantastic opportunity um, for a four to five hundred thousand dollar build you can get on the right property you can get a you know 12 to 14 maybe even a 1600 square foot uh uh laneway suite you can get any you can get four thousand dollars plus in rent we've seen four thousand forty five hundred um amazing amazing the the reason is because the land basis is zero you've already paid for the land or if you want to factor in the cost the incremental cost of the land it's just a little bit more but nowhere do you get that kind of rent uh in toronto uh hell even if you bought a seven hundred thousand dollar condo you still won't get four thousand dollars in rent Right, so just uh, just know that this is coming down the pipe, and then the next one that's coming down the pipe is garden suites. We're not touching upon it here, but just know it's coming down the pipe. So, what do I buy? One size does not fit all. That's basically the point, right? Not uh, there is no best investment property in Toronto. It really depends on you and your situation, right? Uh, not everything's going to be available to everyone. Like, not everyone has the mortgage qualification. Not everyone has the um, the cash to be able to do a five or seven or $800,000 reno, right? So there is no one size fits all. There is no best. It's whatever makes sense for you. Um, okay. One of the things that, 
I want to mention, Matt, is that we do, you know, to that point, we recognize, you know, not everybody's going to invest in like a $1.5 million property. Um, during the full day course, we actually go through a stepping stone approach. Um, you know, it kind of takes you from small investing all the way up to how to get to these large multifamilies. And uh, Florence, who's helping us answer questions, is a perfect example. She's part of our team and she started doing, uh, you know, uh, condo investments. And then, you know, after a couple of years is now into uh, large multifamily properties. It, uh, it, it's definitely possible. So uh, we do go through that as well. Cool, cool. We're actually, because I've made up for your uh, slowness, we're back on time now. <laughs> uh, do, do we want to take a beat? And I don't know. Take, <laughs> My take, detailedness. Yeah, detailedness. Do we want to take a beat? Or do you want me to just kind of plow through and leave to the, the Q&A to the end? What, what, what do you want to do? Yeah, let's keep going. Uh, Shelby's uh, put it, going through all the questions for us to, okay. uh, to queue them up. So she'll have them yeah. ready for us. The looks like Flo just gave me a standing ovation. So I'm going to take it. <laughs> all right. So this is part of the next thing that you're, pr you're probably going to wonder is like, okay, great. You told me all about all these different types of properties. Now, give me some actual numbers. All right, fine. Uh, so these are just models, right? These are business models. Um, these, so we've got our disclaimer down at the bottom, um, you know, just know that these are examples um, and it will, any property that you, uh, if you decide to work with us, any property we actually find is not gonna fit this to exactly. It's gonna follow this uh, uh, in spirit though. Yep. So the first one is a turnkey triplex. So this is one of our, this is basically one of our, this is basically our most basic uh, um, uh, investment property uh, for most people who are buying land. Uh, or buying a house in Toronto. It's about 1.4 million, uh, it'll make it just over, you know, just over $5,700 in rent, $5,750, about $10.50 in expenses. Um, and this is a, it's in a good neighborhood, right? So it's in one of the neighborhoods. Um, I don't, I think we stripped out the map in, in trying to whittle down this presentation, we stripped out the map. Uh, oh, I think it might be in the next slide. But it's at Dundas and Lansdowne, very close to Little Portugal. Um, and uh, it's a, it's a two and a half story semi, um, three turnkey units. So you've got on the second floor, um, you have the second and third floor combined into a two plus den uh, and a one bath. Main floor is a one bedroom, one bath and a basement, one bedroom, one bath. I will say, actually looking at this, I'll say right off the bat, it's actually a little less common for us to see two and a half stories at this price point. At this price point, we'd normally see a two story out of two and a half stories. So this looks like pretty good value for that reason. Uh, looks pretty nice. I'd live there, maybe. <laughs> and there it is, right? It's on, just west of Little Portugal, just east of Ronsi. Ronsi, cool neighborhood. Not a great, not necessarily, uh, a, we don't really find a lot of investment properties in there, so they work there because it's a very expensive neighborhood. But, uh, but that's the point. You're really close to a really good neighborhood, right? Uh, okay, cool. And um, important things to note, you're near transit lines here. Um, so, you know, you, you have the streetcar, dedicated streetcar lines that bring you to downtown Toronto, and that's how your tenants are going to get to work. And what does this look like? $1.4 million property, uh, $1.12 million mortgage. So your down payment required is about two eighty dollars plus land transfer, plus closing costs. You're into roughly just under $350 uh, capital required. Um, Monthly rents, as we said, fifty-seven fifty. Expenses, uh, ten fifty-five. Monthly mortgage, four grand. So we are looking at just over, just over five hundred dollars of cash flow. Normally, I'd expect about five hundred dollars of cash flow, but this property seems a, a tiny bit better. Uh, uh, it's about five. It's about seven hundred dollars of cash flow. There you go. This is a turnkey triplex. This is pretty much a quintessential prototypical property that we could help you find. We help. We do help our clients find all day long. Okay. Um, so what does this look like? Performance after five years. So if you go, if you go, three percent rent increase, two percent inflation, and five percent appreciation. So these are the parameters you can play with. Um, your cash flow will improve over time. So as your rent increases, your rent will continue to increase, and it'll improve your cash flow over time. Just hold. Actually, just holding real estate 
for the long term over an extended period of time improves your cash flow. A lot of people don't think about that. Um, but you can over the over five years, you can expect about five uh, about uh, sixty thousand dollars of cash flow. Uh, this gives a, ca- uh, a cash on cash ROI of three point six. That's a little bit better than what, what I what we normally see. I, w- I would say mostly we see about two two and a half percent cash on cash. Um, equity to pay, pay down on cash. This is pretty set. This will be the pretty much the same across the board. Um, the only factors that that change this are um, amortization rate and interest rate. Okay, and then your appreciation rate. So we use 5% to model. Um, we expect this, we, so which means that we think the property is probably going to go up another 386,000, 387,000 over the next five years, roughly speaking, which, which translates into a return of about 23.2%. So what this all looks like is roughly a 35% return. This is pretty typical of what we expect in Toronto, a 35% return. This is, again, this is the part that we stripped out of this presentation um, down from our masterclass, our full day one. But what are you getting in your mutual funds? What are you getting in your bonds and everything else? This is actually why um, real estate is a great wealth building uh, uh, vehicle. 35% return. Uh, We've seen 50, (laughs) we've seen 55, we've seen 60. Um, It can be done. Uh, we model it conservatively at five percent, though. Cool. Next, highest and best use to maximize your ROI. So again, the, one of the problems is Toronto cash flow is not as strong as the smaller cities. So what do you do? You could, if you're cash flow focused, you just go invest in small cities, I suppose. But if you're intent on investing in Toronto, then what do you do? So the idea here is. Cash flow is limited on turnkey. It's cash flow is limited on cos- even light cosmetic re- renos, but you still want land. So what do you do? We go through. We 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 are focused on adding some serious value, which actually is pu- actually puts us in the category of even like small developer. If we're trying to build, for example, laneway suites, as I mentioned before, if we're trying to if we're trying to do uh, change of use. So um, okay, sorry, this is still uh, laneway. So let me talk a little laneway a bit. So laneways, uh, laneway suites, they, laneway suites can be built as a detached structure from the main house that abut up against the laneway, right? So laneways exist all over downtown Toronto um, and uh, you're starting to see them go up. They're all over the news. They're, you know, they're all over blog TO and Toronto life and stuff like that. Um, so you will pay a premium for, for laneway ready lots now because uh, uh, because of that potential. So, you know, that potential didn't really exist a couple of years ago, but it does now, uh, every, you know, a couple of years ago when they passed the bylaw. So, uh, you know, this is, um, a, this, is, this is one of the best ways to boost cash flow in Toronto. So it's number one, laneway. The other, and then the other part of that is going to be the actual main house itself. So the, what we're talking about here is a legal luxury triplex conversion. So if you combine the two, you got uh, even even uh, a stronger business model. So for a lot that would that would allow us to build a laneway, we're probably looking at uh, about one point and, and do a legal luxury triplex conversion. Uh, we're look, probably looking at a, a purchase price in about the one point six. Uh, one point six meaning that uh, you know t- down payment, closing costs just under four hundred thousand, renovations, triplex conversions. Again, they're not for the faint of heart. And the reason is because they take anywhere from 12 to 16 months to do and require, can require up to over $500,000 of renos. Uh, plus the laneway. The laneway can, you know, it typically falls within the four to $500,000 range to build, which means that it's, you need about 1.05 million on top of your initial investment. So you're talking about 1.4 million, somewhere in that range, right? Uh, of cash that you need to, to do this project. If you're a little more advanced, construction financing uh, is options to you, uh, is available, maybe available to you. Um, more sophisticated investors. Most people will look at this and go, "Where the hell am I going to get you know one point X million dollars of cash?" The reality is, most most people don't have that just sitting in their couch cushions. So what they're typically doing is tapping another property. So maybe refinancing another property, putting a HELOC in another property, uh, or they're raising capital from from other investors. 
joint ventures, uh, GPLP structures, stuff like that. That's how they're getting to. Um, that's how they're getting the uh, the, the uh, investable capital for stuff like this. Okay, so let's move on. Um, One point six million, as I mentioned, down payment, uh, mortgage, closing cost, renovation. We talked about length of the reno. So because we're tacking on laneway, uh, laneway can, but not always can be done or is done in parallel with, with the main house. Sometimes you'll do the main house, uh, maybe open it up, open the permit as a duplex and close it, go build the laneway suite, um, and then come back and try to close, uh, try to finish it off as a triplex, uh, the main house. There's reasons to do that. We're not going to get into that right now, but there's strategies. We work with some of the best architects in the city that know how to deal with the city. The city is very, very complicated. The, the procedures, uh, the, the, the process to get through to the finish line is not straightforward. Um, so we work with some of the best architects uh, to help, help us navigate that process. But again, uh, so tack on a laneway. Um, a laneway, by, just by itself, by the way, a laneway can take up to 12 months, six months for planning and six months for, um, for the build. So, you know, if some of it can be done in parallel, great. Carry costs. Um, so with about uh, 18 months of carry costs, you're talking about another $100,000 $100, of carry costs with no rent coming in. Total investable capital, you're up to 1.5 now. ARV, so you've taken a property, ARV stands for after repaired value. So you've taken a, a $1.6 million property, you've put in about a million bucks, let's say somewhere in that range, and you're turning it into a $3 million plus million, uh, uh, $3 million plus property. There's a caveat here. So yes, the market value of this thing might be 3 million, 3.1, 3.2, 3.3. However, there's two ways to look at ARV. There's market value. If I put it on the market, what could I, what could I realistically fetch? That's market value. Then there's the appraisal value. So that's why I have an asterisk here. So you can't just count on this number that we put here. What matters is going to be the appraisal value. So if you're looking at residential refine, uh, if you're looking at to refinance this on the residential side, you will be looking at comps. You'll be looking at, oh, what did the place down the street sell for? So if there's nothing near you, that ends up being the problem. Um, so that's number one. Number two is how to evaluate laneway suites. Laneway suites, right now appraisers don't know how to value laneway suites. They don't know how to appraise them. Uh, we, you know, we get anywhere from, no, we're not going to consider it, to we'll take it at cost. The reality is it adds a hell of a lot more value than just cost. You know, if you if you built it for four hundred thousand, it's probably going to add more than four hundred thousand dollars of value to the property. But we, there's no good solutions right now. Lenders are behind the eight ball. They're they're lagging. They haven't figured it out. Uh, one of our clients is on a pilot program with one of the top mortgage brokers in the country to work with a pilot program with a lender to try to figure out uh, financing for laneway suites. So we're literally at the forefront of this, helping try to drive drive this forward, drive policy around this. Um, but this, as of right now, there is no widespread ubiquitous solution. So anyway, that's, that's another reason why we have an asterisk here. But let's take a look at this. Uh, so for the most sophisticated folks, um, let's look at this on a commercial refi. So with these rents, uh, with these expenses, I don't have all the calculations here, but what this looks like at about roughly a 1.15, 1.18%, uh, sorry, 1.15, 1.18, uh, DCR, uh, you should be able to get somewhere in the range of two, $2.1 million on the refi. It roughly comes out to just, I think just under 70% loan to value. Um, meaning that you'd be take, you'll be taking out about over 800,000 from the project. So your net capital invested is, is about 700,000. And this is a commercial refi allowing you to then continue to roll forward. Right? So, you know, conversations I'm having with, with clients now is, Hey, um, I want to do more of these, but I keep on getting stuck. Yes, I have got a great salary, but banks just still won't lend to me because I have too many properties. Commercial, re commercial refinance on the back end may, may be your solution. So this is a little more technical. It's a little more advanced, but I'm just throwing, a, throwing in some tidbits there for the, the more advanced uh, 
investors. Cash flow analysis. Okay, so an up for the main house, um, second, third floor, three bedroom, two bath unit, 3,600. Main floor, two bedroom, two bath, 2,800. Basement, two bedroom, two bath, 2,200. Laneway, three bedroom, two bath, 4,000. Total rent, um, 12,600. Then 9,200 for your commercial mortgage, property taxes, um, utilities, insurance. Uh, the assumption here is that it's going to be separately hydrometered, separately gas metered. Uh, so that's all on the tent. So all these are, are plus, plus uh, gas plus hydro. And net, uh, which means that cash flow, cash flow is 2,000 bucks. This is after you refinanced. Cool. So, uh, where are we at now? Still making pretty some pretty good time. Uh, what would you? So now that we're here, uh, Ming, Flo, Shelby, this is the last big part of our presentation. Do you want me to just continue plowing through, or do you want to take a beat here? Let's uh, let's keep going. Let's finish this off. Uh, I know Shelby's accumulated a whole ton of questions, uh, which I think will take a good half hour, forty five minutes at the end, anyway. So okay. Okay. Yeah, finish this off and then we'll get into the Q&A. Cool. So, you know, all the stuff that I've talked about, uh, that Ming has talked about up until now, that I've talked about till now, we've taught this before. We've taught this a, a million times. Um, it's, you know, it's peppered through throughout six years of meetups that we've been doing on a monthly basis. I decided to take this section in a new direction. And uh, what this is, if you remember from Ming's uh Ming's part of the presentation right in the beginning, it talked about volition. It talked about uh, volition, who we are, uh, what we do, uh, talked about our mission statement, and talked about what we, how we help clients. We have four areas, four divisions of the company. One is advisory, one is investment realty, one is uh, renovation services, and then the last one is uh, leasing property management. So I want, to, I want to talk a little bit about advisory. What is advisory? What do you do in advisory? Why does it even exist? Aren't you guys just a kind of a realty team? Volition is more than just realty. Volition is a real estate investment advisory and realty firm. And I want to get into a little bit about what advisory is via a client profile case study. So I've anonymized everything here, um, but I want to talk. I, I want to. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, uh, an advisory session that I had um, fairly recently. I've actually kind of melded two clients kind of together um, to sort of obfuscate the some of the specifics. Uh, but the, 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 the general themes are, are still there. So everything we've talked about in our presentation so far, so let's see what we've gone over. You know, the most important questions to ask yourself when choosing where to invest. You know, why Toronto is a great place to invest, but, you know, harder to invest in small town than small towns. Where to invest in Toronto? We've talked about that, kind of downtown core, the, the residential neighborhoods surrounding the downtown core. We've talked about risk and the risk factors in real estate and time. We've talked about cash flow, the role of cash flow. We've, how to get to massive cash flow via the multiplier effect. We've talked about two different business models that work in Toronto that our clients are actively employing right now. But what's missing? There's one key missing component, and that is you. That's you. That's you. That's you. That's you. That's you the investor. That's you. Your situation. Your circumstances. Your goals. Mapping that on top of everything else is incredibly important. Because basically everything we've been talking about is very, very general. It's, it's like, okay, the business model, but does that actually work for you? Does that make sense for you in your context? That's what advisory is. In advisory, we aspire to really understand where you are now. We want to understand where you want to go, and then we will help you build that plan to get there. So more specifically, it's understanding where you are at right now, you know, properties, uh, how many properties you have, um, investable capital, mortgage qualification, uh, salary, all those types of things. Then we want to figure out what your goals are. And I'm not talking about real estate goals. So if you're coming to me going, my goal is 10 properties. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's, uh, let's back up the train a little bit. Let's take this, up a, take this up a level and let's take a higher level view over this. What are you doing this for? Like really, what, you know, why, would you, why are you going down this path? And if your answer is money, that's not the answer. Money's a part of it. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a consequence of what, what it is that you're trying to achieve, but that's not the goal. The goal is, you know, more life, more about what you want out of 
your life, the lifestyle that you want for yourself. Maybe that means you want to retire early or semi-retire or have the flexibility to take on contract consulting gigs and be in control of your own time. Maybe it means more time with the family. Maybe it means you want to travel more. Maybe it means you want to put your kids through school. Maybe it means you want to put your, uh, you want to take care of your uh, aging parents um, as uh, in their, in their, um, as they continue to age. Those types of things, right? Now that we understand what those life goals are, and we time bound it as well, then we translate those into financial goals. So it's like, okay, you know, I want, you know, I want to replace a lot of people start off this. Uh, I want to replace my job. Well, I can make a, I make a hundred thousand dollars. So okay, that's like eight grand a month. Okay, you use that as a baseline. Now you have a financial goal. Then we translate them to a, a a real estate goal. And then once we have a real estate goal, I can help you build that real estate plan to get there. So that's really this advisory framework. The inter- you know the client will provide some information, but we'll be asking really deep probing questions during advisory. And the idea is the output of which should be a concrete real estate plan and actionable next steps on what you need to do to achieve that. The next, so you'll understand your next step. So let's dive into what, what this one looks like. So, you know, we've got a client who, uh, current, you know, he came to the, the meeting and he's like, oh, okay, this is, you know, I bought a, I bought a property. Okay, I've got two properties. I bought it in 2012 and it was a semi for 400,000. Live one unit, I rent out the other. Um, and I bought a condo in 20, 2019, you know, in, for 5, 10. It has been really great because it went up in value. That's what they came to the conversation with, right? I uh, asked them what their goals were. They're like, oh, I want to, I want to kind of retire in 10 years. And, you know, I think Toronto is the right place to do it. I want to, you know, I, I want to invest in Toronto, but I don't know how it's too expensive. Um, and I can't qualify for a mortgage uh, enough to uh, buy a property in Toronto. And actually I don't have enough money. I, I managed to buy this condo scrape, scraped enough for, together for this condo, but I don't have enough and prices are going through the roof. Like, what do I, I, I don't think Toronto makes sense for me, but you know, I want to talk to you about it. So they wanted to figure out how their real estate, they didn't know what their real estate goals were. They kind of knew what their life goals were, but they didn't know what to do next. And that's where, that's where I came in. So I went from, you know, the information the client provided to asking the, these deep probing question. In fact, you know, this client who came in didn't even come in with all the right information. It wasn't enough information. And you know, it's not their fault, they, they don't know, but we know what the right questions are to ask. So I got them, I went through a rundown with, with, with him in order to figure out what the, rest, what, the, what the rest of the situation looked like. So went through the value of the property. So I, I didn't, quite honestly, I didn't care that he bought it at 400,000. I cared what the value is now, right? Um, I didn't care that he bought it for 510. I care what, it, what the value is now. So semi, duplex, uh, 1.2, sorry, 1.1. Uh, he gets one rent for, uh, from one unit for 1600, lives in the other unit. The market rent for that unit is 1800. The market unit for his unit would have been 2000. There's a mortgage on it. And it's actually a fairly small mortgage, relatively speaking. This person has tons of equity. They just didn't know how to best use it. So, you know, with expenses uh, of 1100, the total costs was, was 2800 and which means that the uh, total carry cost is 2800. So expenses plus the monthly, monthly mortgage, the current cash flow was negative 1200. So basically that was his cost to live there. And if he moved out, this property would cash flow 800 bucks. So I looked at this and go, oh, like, like the, he looked at it and was like, oh, you know, it's a pretty good property, right? I was like, we'll see, <laughs> we'll see. Um, and then, you know, we, 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 then we went on to his condo. Um, condo is worth 700 now. It's got a, it's got a mortgage of 390. Um, he rented out for 1950. Expenses are 2,500. He's cash flow negative 600 bucks. He's like, yeah, but um, I think it's a good one because it went up in value. I'm like, yes. It, did go up in value. Here's the thing. 
This person, by the way, is an ex in an extremely advantageous position. They didn't quite know it, but I looked at this and I was like, you're in a great position. However, what got you here is not necessarily what's going to take you forward. What got you here is not necessarily going to help you reach your goals moving forward. So it's fantastic that you bought this at 400,000 and now it's worth 1.1 million. However, let's take a closer look at the property. So essentially, this is the first thing that I do with clients. I, I analyze their property at 80% loan to value, meaning that yes, this person had a, how big was their mortgage? $450,000 mortgage. I don't run it at their mortgage, their current value of their mortgage, I run it at 80% loan to value. So 80% loan to value of 1.1 million is like 880. So that means that there is $430,000 of equity uh, in this property that is being underutilized right now. So if you take a look at this, the, f the, the f okay, so if he moved out, it would be $800 positive cash flow. That's why he thinks it's a great property. The reality is he's just subsidizing the underperformance of the property with his own equity. That's the only reason that the property uh, seems to cash flow for him. So the equity in the property is not being put to highest and best use. So what do you do? What are the options? You could do nothing, you could refi, he could move out, you could renovate to try to get rents up or divest. Condo, similar. Um, similar story, actually. Uh, it increased in value uh, quite a bit since he bought it, but it's not helping him reach his goals. So what are the options? Do nothing, refi, uh, move in, renovate, or divest, right? So I've enumerated a couple of, a few options. I've never tell someone what to do uh, because there's another aspect, Their per, your, your personal situation, your personal goals and you know, your living situation, that has sometimes layers on to people's, um, uh, on, top, on, top of peop on top of people's real estate plans. So the reality is, is that I can come in and look at this completely objectively. I've got no emotional attachment to any of this. Um, I can look at this objectively, I can look at the financials and I can determine whether these are performing properties or not. Um, however, I will definitely be taking into account, you know, certain things. It's like, okay, but I really want to keep this property for reasons X, Y, Z. I really want to like live in this condo, or I really think that if I do X, Y, Z to this property, I'll get it. Okay, fine. Or I want to keep this for my, for my kid. Okay, fine. Like there's definitely reasons. Uh, but this person, I spoke to them, they were unattached. Uh, she did believe that she, uh, sorry, he, uh, he did believe that uh, he'd picked a, you know, had some great properties, but he was unattached. So he was willing to listen. So the idea here though, is that when I looked at how he was going to move forward, he didn't have enough capital. He didn't have enough mortgage qualification. I think his mortgage qualification was 400,000 for his next property. So that definitely was not gonna be enough to buy another property in Toronto, maybe a condo, but you know, as we said, uh, we're trying to get to land. Um, so I analyzed his property at 80% loan to value, and we, we, we determined that these underperforming properties are dragging down his mortgage qualification abilities. So you, he has basically one of two options. He can refinance uh, the existing properties up, back up to as high as he can, close to 80% loan to value, that being the down payment closing cost, the, the liquid capital for his future investments, but uh, and then make the cash flow negative properties even more cash flow negative but that doesn't help him qualify for his next property these current two properties were dragging down his mortgage qualification so that was the problem so that was not going to help him move forward so what i told this what i told this gentleman was he needs to go back to his mortgage broker and run different scenarios so the scenario because they, they, they basically came to me saying, hey, my mortgage broker said I can qualify for 400,000 or something like that, right? So I said, go back to your mortgage broker and say to this mortgage broker, hey, if I'm unencumbered by these other two properties, what would it look like? If I divested these other two properties, then what my mortgage qualification would be. His mortgage qualification 
went up to uh, $1 million, right? We're in well within the territory now of being able to acquire a $1.4 million triplex. So does that make sense? Are you seeing how the properties that you have in your portfolio now can be what's actually holding you back from moving forward? People don't, people don't usually like to hear that. A lot of people are like, no, I'm really, you know, because it's done so, so well for them, or maybe they live there, or maybe like, I don't know, maybe they raise kids in it or like whatever. There's all these other reasons people become attached to it. But the reality is in certain instances, detaching yourself from that property is what is it going to allow you to think more objectively to move forward and towards your goals, right? So for this person, uh, their mortgage qualification jumps substantially. And once they were to divest the properties, they would walk away with about $800,000 of capital. So I don't have all the numbers here. I, I, uh, I did all the calculations on the back end. I didn't want to bother you with the numbers, but the idea here is uh, there'd be principal residents here. So avoiding cap gains here, you would be paying 25% on the, on the cap gains. So that was factored into realty, realtor fees, uh, mortgage break fees, things like that, uh, lawyer fees. And then you'd be walking away with a good chunk of change. What is it? What do you require to, to buy a $1.4 million property? If with 80% loan to value on a normal, like a normal 80% loan to value, a $1.4 million property, I believe is a $1.12 million mortgage. She couldn't get a $1.2 she couldn't get a one point, or he couldn't get a one point one two million dollar mortgage. Uh, he could only get a one million dollar mortgage, which means he had to put up a little more of a down payment, less than ideal, but still workable, right? So the capital required four hundred thousand dollar down payment, closing costs. So four fifty was the capital capital in now. Uh, rents fifty seven hundred. Uh, triplex. So the expenses for a triplex about eleven hundred. Mortgage. At a normal 80% loan to value, uh, a mortgage would be 500 bucks. In his, uh, in his example, he's got a slightly less more, a slightly smaller mortgage actually. And so how it all kind of netted out for him and he's living in a $2,100 unit, one of the $2,100 units, his cost of living was about 1200 bucks. So he's, now he's living in a viable, it, it, he was living in one of the units. Now he owns a very viable investment property. So you can't analyze it with him living in it. That's tough to do. But uh, if he wasn't living in it, this property would, would be a cash flow positive property in a great location. We would help him select that. That has great upside potential. Okay. And then this person still has a bunch of cash afterward, right? So still $360,000 of cash. What can you do with that cash? You could, number one, use it for innovations. You could boost rents. You could put it into a bigger down payment. You could get it up to maybe a $1.7 million property with perhaps $6,500 in rents to bring down the cost of living even further. Um, or maybe eventually, like if, you could, if they could solve their mortgage qualification piece, um, they could use that to go buy another property. In fact, $360,000 is enough for a down payment closing costs for another $1.5 million property. So what I said here was remember the four M's. So prior to the, uh, prior to us starting this presentation, I was answering a few questions. And one of the things I talked about was the four M's. It takes four things. You need four things to do a deal. You need four M's to do a deal. M, uh, first M, money. That's the down payment closing costs, maybe renovation money if that's uh, part of the business model. Next one is mortgage. You need more qualification. Um, next one is mastery. You need to know what the hell you're doing. And last one is management. That's not property management. That's asset management. You need to manage it like an asset on an, on an ongoing basis. So they need a mortgage qualifier, qualifier. Potentially, they have enough capital to bring to the table. They just need a mortgage qualifier. So that mortgage qualifier could be um, that could be family, it could be friends, it could be a life partner, it could be a joint venture partner, it could be a bank of mom and dad. There, this is where this is where now this more depends on you and your ability to raise capital, your ability to generate confidence 
to, to project that confidence so that others will want to invest with you, right? So the, the reality is everyone is going to hit the financing wall. You're either going to run out of money or you're, you either have run out of money or you're going to run out of money. You're either have run out of mortgage qualification or you are going to run out of mortgage qualification. So that's why joint venture partners or, you know, life partners or whatever uh, end up being valuable in, in those regards, right? So, so that's what this person could potentially do, just to try to think about how to grow their portfolio on an ongoing basis. But looking at this and thinking, thinking this through a little more, what could we, you know, more advanced ways of looking at this? HELOC. Instead of just a $1 million mortgage, so they're allowed to do $1 million of financing. If possible, if they're able to, able to work with their mortgage broker, they could potentially split that up into a, um, you're allowed to get, a, uh, to, to structure a part of that like a HELOC. You can go up to 65% loan to value with a HELOC. That's the maximum. Can't go beyond 65% loan to value. So that means you could go, you know, this was a, this was a 71.5% um, financing. So that means you could go, that's this number right here. That means you could go up to 65% loan to value and you could go 6.5% mortgage segment, right? Why would you do that? Why, why would you do that? And especially HELOCs normally have higher interest rates. Call it 3% instead of, you know, 1.75 or instead of 2%. Why would I pay more in, in interest? The reason is flexibility. With a HELOC, you're not forced to pay principal down. With a mortgage, you have to pay P&I, principal and interest. Every mortgage payment, P&I. Every mortgage payment, P&I. The next mortgage payment, P&I, always. HELOCs allow you just to pay the interest component. And it's not the be all and end all because it means then that you're not paying principal down. So if your intention is to pay, if you're, if you're strategy is to pay down the property over time, HELOCs aren't for you. But if you understand real estate a bit differently and you understand that, you know, I'm not waiting 30 years, paying down the mortgage little by little isn't really getting me to where I want to go. Uh, and you want to, for example, boost cash flow, this might be an option for you. What you can do is structure a HELOC, maximum 65% loan to value. What this allowed this person, this, what this would allow this person to do is take 65% loan to value of the, of the property value. So the property value is 1.4 million. 65% of that is 910,000. So 910 could go as a HELOC. 90,000 could go as a mortgage. So 910,000 as a HELOC, 90,000 as a mortgage. The $910,000 HELOC would be $2,300 a month in interest. And then the mortgage component would be 300 bucks. Total financing on this on a monthly basis would be $2,600 plus your expenses of 1,100 bucks means your, your carry cost $3,700. Your rents on this place was 5,700, 5, but they live in a unit that's worth 2,100. So they're, they're only re receiving $3,600 in rent. They're basically now living for free. Previously, if you go back, Living in one unit, living in a $2,100 unit would cost this guy 1200 bucks. We've restructured this in a way where he's now almost living for free. This is the importance of understanding, the, thoroughly understanding the mechanisms through which you can build wealth in real estate, understanding real estate at such a deep level that you can play with these different levers uh, and that you can tweak these things to suit your situation, right? Um, okay, so then the next thing on top of that, if you remember, there was $360,000 of unused funds. So the, the unused funds, you could put that back into your HELOC, bringing your HELOC balance even further down to $550,000. That brings it to $1,400 a month. This means that you've now turned this into a $800 positive cash flow while living there. He lives in one unit and still makes $800 positive cash flow. So it's not quite the $5,000 a month that he was looking for because he wanted to retire. Uh, he wanted $5,000 uh, $5, a month. That was, his, that was his goal. 
So, so, so we're, we're short of that. So what do we do now? So let's assume that they could figure out the whole mortgage qualification thing, uh, JV partner, life partner, parents, whatever. Let's say that they purchased this one triplex that we were talking about. Let's say that they soon thereafter figure out how to buy another triplex. So now they don't have just, just have one, they have two. So they have a mortgage on the first one of 1 million. They have a mortgage on the second one of 1.12. Let's just say they hold it for 10 years because he wanted to retire in 10 years. The value of the triplex would go up to just under 2.4 million for both of them. Uh, the rents for both of them would go up to 76, uh, 76.50. What do you do? In about 10 years, you could sell one of them, take the proceeds and pay off the mortgage of the other one. You sell this guy here, especially since he, used to, he lives here, and it's be primary, um, you can minimize cap gains because his primary residence. Uh, and the proceeds, so the mortgage will get paid down to, because it's a HELOC, let's just say, uh, he's still not paying off a lot of the mortgage. The proceeds are 1.3 million. Let's just say that the mortgage over on this, this guy over here is 800 and 818,000. Your proceeds of 1.3 million is paying off this mortgage and putting almost $500,000 in his pocket still. He's still living in one unit. Uh, the, the, the value of that unit is 2,800. Now it used to be 2,100. The remaining rents are 4,800. Let's say your expenses have gone up over the 10 years too. Cash flow, living there, just owning this one property. He moves into the he moves into this new property. Cash flow is thirty five hundred dollars while living there in about ten years. Not quite five thousand dollars in uh, in in cash flow, but this person would still have five hundred thousand dollars on hand. So what can you do at that point? You could still you could still tweak the plan. You could go less aggressive. You could go less aggressive. So at the six year mark, you could the real realistically you don't need to wait ten years. That was their plan. Wait ten years, but you could wait six years. Six years you could this guy could pay off this guy. If you sold this guy, you could pay off the entire mortgage of this guy. You wouldn't have an extra $500,000 in your hand, uh, in your pocket, but you would pay off the other property. Or you could be more aggressive. Instead of just waiting 10 years, at, the, at about the four or five year mark, you could refinance both properties and purchase two more properties. Again, this is subject to mortgage qualification. But the idea here is build up even more equity over the next five years, and at the 10 year mark, keep two properties in your portfolio instead of just one, this would be about $10,000 of cash flow instead of just $3,500. Same time frame, he was just more aggressive now that the four or five year mark decided that he wanted to grow his portfolio. So, um, so how does this look? $10,000 in, in positive cash flow. Um, how does that look versus his, his current plan, his current path? His current path is Negative cash flow on one property, negative cash flow on the other property. Does that get him to where he wants to go? The idea here, the take, the main takeaway here, and I know I've gotten down to the weeds and down to you know deep into this personal this person this person's personal situation, but the idea here, the takeaway here is that the actual investment property you want to buy is just one component to your overall investment journey. You really need to map you and your situation onto your investment goals. And that is really what we do here at, 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 at Volition uh, through our advisory services. We will help you figure out what your next step is. So that's, uh, that's it in a nutshell. Um, so if you're like, what is your next step? You could very, if you're, if you're interested, um, the same way that this, I took this person through this journey uh, for a complimentary advisory session, um, you can sign up for a complimentary advisory session. Um, it's a, it's uh, completely free of charge, uh, no strings attached. Um, just come prepared. Come prepared with um, uh, you know the capital you have to invest, your mortgage qualification, your goals, and anything like uh, details about your current portfolio. Um, and then we'll 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 help you figure out where you want to go and figure out how to plan to get there. So that's uh, yeah, hopefully that uh, you know. Thanks a lot, Matt. For the, like it was super detailed, and you know. Um, probably went down a path, I think that more people, you know, deeper than more people were expecting, but uh, hopefully it demonstrates like what we do in advisory. Uh, you know, typically this is a $500 an hour service when it's charged separately. And, you know, so take advantage of the complimentary session. 
uh, you know, to, to, to look at your investing situation and, and where to take it from there. Cause there's lots of creative things that can be done. Um, yeah. So, you know, I highly recommend signing up. Um, well, so in mean, terms of like what's happening next. Sorry, I think uh, Shelby's going to drop the um, advisory link into the chat if she hasn't already. So yeah, that's, yeah, that's good that. yeah, good stuff. A couple of times. <laughs> yep. Good stuff. Cool. Uh, so yeah, next steps, we've got a, we've got another meetup. We do these monthly. Uh, so for those of you who are new, who want to continue your real estate education journey, uh, please join us next week. Uh, we're getting into financing, uh, and this is the financing blueprint. So, you know, it's easy to buy one, maybe even two, uh, but it gets really complicated once you start getting into multiple properties and how do you line up the lenders, uh, and your financing. So that way you can continue to invest over time. One of the questions in the comments uh, we had was around like, you know, the multiplier effect looks good, but uh, like, how do you actually execute upon that? And there's a lot of assumptions we're making because uh, we're trying to demonstrate a model in, in very limited time. Uh, but a big part of that is actually having a financing blueprint. So you're able to go through and execute on multiple properties over time. You want the next slide? And we always like to end off our meetups with this. Uh, who can do it? You can do it. Uh, you know, we, we, we all started somewhere with what our first rental property. Uh, so we, we, we truly believe every, it's within everybody's capacity to, to become successful real estate investors. Um, cool. So we've got a whole bunch of questions lined up. Um, maybe Shelby, you can just fire off to us uh, the first one and we'll dive right into it. Yeah, I thought this was a really good one coming off of the advisory case study. <laughs> how, how could you possibly go through all of this in 30 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> so maybe, Matt, do you want to explain a little bit about how you would take someone through this and maybe it doesn't all happen on the first session? Yeah, because I think we took 50 minutes to explain it. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> Uh, it doesn't all happen in the, in the first session. The first session is really to get, um, you, you're not going to have a plan completely built out for you by the, uh, in, a, in a complimentary session. The complimentary session is to better understand whether or not we can actually help you or not. If we can't help you, I can't work with you, right? If you're coming to me and um, you're not in a situation where I think I can, I can actually um, uh, help you achieve your goals. I'll tell you right off the bat. Um, I I can't I I can't help. I actually recognize I can't help everyone. And uh, so what ends up happening then is it it is really is a sort of a meet and greet for us to see if we think we work well together, whether um, you think we offer value, and whether we think we can actually help you. Um, a big part of a, a, out of the thirty minute complimentary session you usually have homework. You usually need to take it back. You need to usually go back to a mortgage broker. A mortgage broker and your mortgage qualification is a big part of the inputs into this model. If you remember, one of the things I, I had this person do is I sent them back to the mortgage broker. That was the end of our complimentary session, actually, right? Everything thereafter was through subsequent sessions and then kind of back end work that I did to develop this plan, which I then took it back and presented uh, to him. So oh, does that make more sense? So no, it doesn't happen in 30 minutes. <laughs> I can't solve all of your life problems in 30 minutes. No. Awesome. I'll, uh, I'll read them out and also pop them in the chat. So two questions sort of focused on the risk of Toronto. Yep. So GTA had good population growth in the 1980s, yet there was still a market correction. Don't you think the GTA is still risky? And then also, why are some agents advocating GTA exodus? So let me uh, let me talk some of this. Or I'm just getting uh, I'm typing messages and, <laughs> and trying to answer stuff at the same time. Um, so let me talk about the the exodus part because uh, like this is a this is a favorite topic of mine. Um, so absolutely, there is a decrease of existing population net out of Toronto. So if you are a Toronto resident. Um, there, there were more people moving out uh, in 2021 and part of 2020 than there were moving in, but the net population increased. And that's always the part that these, uh, you know, people who are 
trying to sell houses outside of the city or, uh, you know, people trying to get you to click so they can get paid for, for a headline. Uh, that's the part they always miss, right? They, you need a sensational headline. Oh, mass exodus from Toronto. Uh, but if you're living in Toronto, it's not a mass exodus. It, it feels when you're driving around here, like it's worse uh, in terms of, of traffic and, and things like this uh, since the pandemic. And that's because actually our population has increased through the pandemic. How? Immigration. Um, so, the, the, the government has a, a mandated, I think it's 450,000 people moving into Canada uh, per year to catch up for the immigration that was lost during COVID. That's crazy. Like 35% of that 400 plus thousand end up in Toronto. So you've got a small city that has just replaced, you know, the, the people that are living out in the country. Um, so that, that's the part that's missing uh, a lot from the, these headlines is, is actually the city is still growing and that's happening through, through immigration. Uh, why? There's a couple of things. Jobs, that's the big one. The other one is like uh, most people, they, when they're coming to Canada, they have heard of Toronto. They have maybe heard of Vancouver and Ottawa, but they certainly haven't heard of Brantford or, or, or Oakville or some of these other uh, places. So th this is where they start. It's, it's a common story. Also, if you're coming with money, uh, they want to come to the city they've heard of and they know of and where some of their relatives or whatever could be uh, living. We have large existing immigration populations here, so they're coming to Toronto. Uh, there was a second part to that question, Shelby. Oh, uh, you're on mute. Thank you. So in the chat, um, the Toronto and GTA had good population growth in the 80s, yet there was still a market correction. Don't you think the GTA market is risky now? Yeah, so I think there, will there be a correction? <laughs> like, like uh, if you've been following Volition for a while, I, I have my monthly what, like crystal ball days. And that crystal ball is getting worse and worse because um, the factors around it are becoming more and more difficult to predict. Um, is there going to be a correction? Yes. When is it going to happen? I have no idea. That's the hard part, right? We know it's a cycle. And, you know, if you asked me March 2020, is COVID the event that's going to cause us to have a market correction? I would have said absolutely yes. We are in a pandemic. We're quarantined. We're stuck at home. Nobody's going to be buying houses. That's ridiculous. But 2020, as we all know, turned out to be a record year, followed by another record year in 2021. So um, when is this correction going to happen? I don't know. We're looking at major uh, interest rate increases coming down the line. It's something that has to be done. We're facing some record inflation as well. And that's really one of the major tools that the central bank is going to use to, to, to mitigate inflation. Now, how much of a correction? Uh, so how much of a change are we going to get in interest rates? Are we going to get, I don't know, the five to six that some, you know, market pundits are saying? Are we going to get, a th you know, two to three hikes at a quarter percent? I hope it, it is something moderate. The last bunch of recessions have really been kicked off by poor planning uh, and too fast of interest rate hikes. So uh, if you're looking to invest in real estate, remember, uh, we, we have all these actually I'm saying remember, like we presented these slides, and we have all these slides which show how it's time in the market, right? You, you need to invest over a period of time. And even in a declining market, you still make money. Uh, there was another question earlier on, like, this is all great, but what happens when the market declines? And absolutely, you can actually make money as the market declines, and we have the math to show that. Um, but we didn't it's present funny. it because we only have like an hour. It's, it's, it's funny. I literally have slides on that that I took out in the interest of time. Yeah. Not, not time in the market or anything yeah. like that. Just time. We, we literally talk about this stuff because it, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I mean, sign up for the full, full day course. Uh, we have that information. Um, but, but yeah, like, you know, is this, is it a risky time? It, it, it has been <laughs> for like the last seven years. We've been at a peak market for a long period of time. And every time you're at a peak market, it's risky because is it going to continue? It's really hard to say. So for me as an investor, because I'm still a real estate investor, you know, I'm not looking at that short term. For me, it's like, am I buying in areas that are meeting the fundamentals that, you know, have public transit that have, you know, within 800 to, you know, 950 meters of a subway stop. Uh, like I'm hitting all those fundamentals because if the maps in a year or two, well, so be it. If I'm getting the rents, I'm still getting the ten profiles. It doesn't really matter. What matters is if I, if I have to sell during a downturn. And I, the only time that's going to happen is if I'm bought in a crappy area where I can't attract good tenants, where I can't get good rents. Then I'm exposed. Then I have to sell. Then I realize those losses. 
So hopefully that helps. Awesome. That was actually the next question I had lined up. So you answered that. <laughs> oh, uh -oh. Keep throwing them at me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, so I think this is our last one. Um, and we may have covered a bit, but when would you recommend investing in pre-construction and when in something that's already built? Ooh. Um, okay. So that, it's a great question. And I think it really depends on your situation. So, yeah, I hate to give this it depends answer, but it, it does. So when would I go pre-construction? I would go pre-construction if the project makes sense. Uh, and what I mean by that is, does the per square foot cost make sense? Does it meet all the other fundamentals of tenant profiles, subway access? Uh, yeah, I keep saying subway. I mean, mass transit can be a bunch of things. Uh, so, you know, does it meet all our investment profiles? Plus, does the pricing make sense? Because what's happening a lot of times these days is, sure, the uh, we might hit some of our fundamentals, but then the pricing is way off, 1600 1700 a square foot. That's ridiculous, right? Uh, so that doesn't make sense. Um, or uh, adding on top of that, that the payment structure makes sense for you. Sometimes they have advantageous payment structures. You can get in at 10% down. Great. Uh, maybe I'm willing to give up a per you know, per square foot uh, cost to have a more advantageous payment structure. So it depends. Have we come across pre-construction projects that make sense? Not in a while. As Matt said, it's been about a year and a half since we've had like a big project that we pushed because it, it made sense. Um, so in general, pre-construction, I don't say it doesn't make sense, but it, it's been few and far between that we found projects that work for investors. So that this, it, you know, Flipping to, does it make sense to buy something that's already built? Maybe. Um, it depends on your situation and how much can you qualify for? How much can you afford? It may not be a reality to go buy an existing turnkey triplex, right? And you may have to take a stepping stone approach. Maybe you're buying a, a, an existing condo uh, and living in one room and renting out the other and house hacking or doing something along those lines to build equity, to go and continue up the property ladder and getting into better uh, types of investments. Somebody, a question like that is actually perfect for advisory. So, yeah. I, yeah. I, way, um, what else we got, Shelby? The one thing I was just going to add was uh, I'd be flipping the question on its head. As opposed to should I buy condo or should I buy uh, a resale condo versus pre construction condo, I'd be looking at areas. So, for example, one of the areas that we touch upon in uh, or spent a, a quite a big chunk of time on. Uh, during our presentation on Toronto's next house neighborhoods was East Harbor. So for example, if you could, if you could find something in and around East Harbor, which is toted, uh, toted to be the next union station, um, doesn't like to me, it doesn't really matter if it's going to be pre-construction or, or not. Right. If you can find something that makes sense in an area that's, uh, slated for massive development, massive growth, uh, imagine being able to own something, near the new union station right so that the, the 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 in that way the type of asset or whether it's pre-construction or, or or resale condo it, it matters a, a, a little bit less rather than um the actual location and uh your proximity to to transit or newly developed transit so that's how i would be approaching it rather than oh should i buy a condo or pre or pre con well, thank you. So it is nine. I'm going to launch a poll. Um, sorry, there's a... Go ahead. <laughs> People can fill it out while you're chatting. Um, there's a question popped up, which is basically, you know, if I'll summate it, it's how do we make money? Uh, and it's a very fair question because I think we come across a little complicated, but it's actually not that way. Um, we're not financial advisors. We actually work with financial advisors. So if you have a financial advisor, we work with them. They're part of the team. We are real estate investors at the end of the day. We're ourselves real estate investors. And I have a financial advisor that, that I work with and, and, and Matt has one as well. Um, we don't charge for the financial advice. So we don't make money off that right? Primarily, the way we make money is as realtors, as running a brokerage. So when you buy an investment property through us, we get paid commission. And that's how the business runs. Uh, if you, you know, do construction with us, we make some money off construction as well. But that is 
we provide advisory as, as a highly valuable value add uh, because we realize that, you know, well, one, we have experience in this, but also we need to separate ourselves from the crowd, right? We're not, we're not kind of your average realtors in that respect and we need to demonstrate it and we demonstrate it through our advisory services. So hopefully that's clear. Like we're not financial planners. We're not financially planner certified. Uh, we work with financial planners as part of an overall financial picture. Yeah, it was funny. Uh, I saw one of the questions was, why are so many agents advocating a GTA exodus? Uh, <laughs> it's funny, like, you know, <laughs> we we don't think of ourselves as normal agents. I don't think normal agents look at the same stuff we do. Realty is a part of what we do, but we go a hell of a lot deeper than that. Um, so why are so many agents ad advocating a GTA exodus and, you know, invest inside GTA or whatever, um, I'd just say because they don't have the depth of knowledge and experience that we bring to the table. So, uh, yeah, uh, you know, we are agents, but we are a hell of a lot more than that too. <laughs> or Dewey. I saw, I saw Dewey's note. There's no supply. Yeah. In or it is for Dewey, true. Like, like, we're, like, there's no supply anywhere right now. But yeah, supply is really, really tight. If we were going through our monthly market numbers, we're at some like record lows. There's a bunch of things push, you know, a bunch of reasons why we have such little supply right now. A uh, big part is actually Omicron. And we saw a bunch of properties get pulled off the market. When I talk with agents, they just don't want people going through their house right now, uh, especially if they're tenanted. They don't want at all the possibility of their tenants getting sick from somebody coming through and kind of the legal implications behind that for them. Uh, so a bunch of properties disappeared once uh, Omicron lockdown started. So that, that this part of it, but uh, hopefully that uh, gives a bit of insight. Uh, any other questions before we kind of uh, wrap up for the evening? We've covered all the ones in the chat. Yeah, were you guys active on the chat? Um, were you guys active on the chat answering stuff? Yeah, the team was. Oh, good stuff. Wow. Okay. Well, if there's nothing else, I want to thank everybody for joining tonight. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, uh, sign up for our advisory. It is a, it's a great service uh, just to help you at least evaluate where you are and where you could possibly uh, go. And, uh, you know, if we're, we're lucky enough, we, we get to work together. But if not, hopefully the 30 minutes is still, uh, still valuable time for you. Uh, yeah, so hopefully we we'll see everybody next month. Uh, financing presentation, it's really useful if you're an, a new investor or an experienced investor to understand what your financing path is. Because, you know, as they say, it's not if you're running out of money, it's when or you're already there. So uh, having a good financing plan is really key uh, to your investment strategy. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, everybody, for attending tonight. Take care. Look at that, we're on time. Almost. <laughs>